Streaming worldwide, this is the Gospel America Television Network. Welcome to the Kingdom Living Broadcast with Apostle Ken and Pastor Sheila Giles. Now let's join Apostle Ken Giles for part 14 of Faith and the Kingdom of Heaven. There is a word from the Lord on today, and it shall come forth from the book of Genesis, the first chapter and the first verse will be our first foundational scripture. Our second foundational scripture will be Hebrews, the 11th chapter and the sixth verse. Amen. Genesis 1 and 1 in Hebrews 11 and 6. As always, I'll be reading according to the New American Standard Version, and it reads as follows. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In Hebrews 11 and 6, it reads, and without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who Seek him. I'm privileged today to share with you from our continued theme and thesis entitled Faith and the Kingdom of Heaven. You can't have one without the other. And we'll be doing part 14 of this series today. And our sub theme and thesis will be Faith in the Kingdom of Heaven is utilizing one's full ability. Let me say that again. Faith in the kingdom of heaven is utilizing one's full ability. Part 14 here of this series, Faith and the Kingdom of Heaven, you can't have one without the other. We've said before here in this opening scripture of Genesis 1 and 1, God makes a declaration, and the person who hears this declaration is faced with a decision. Either God is God, or he's not. Either he's the creator of the heavens and the earth, or he's not. Either he is the supreme ruler and the supreme judge, or he is not. Either he has complete and supreme dominion and rule and authority over all of creation, or he does not. And then Hebrews 11 and 6 says, And without faith, it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. That word believe there um, in the Greek literally translates must be fully persuaded. And I don't know about you today. But I thank God for being fully persuaded. I thank God for the fact that, that I know that he is the maker and he is our maker and our creator. Even of heaven and earth and all that is in it. Uh, Proverb 24 says it this way, or Psalm 24 says it this way, that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all that is in it. And so we thank God for the fact of being fully persuaded because I'm going to tell you something. The person who's not fully persuaded, number one, cannot please God. The one who is not fully persuaded does not recognize God as God. The one who is not fully persuaded cannot expect anything from God. For the scripture says that the man who is double-minded, in other words, the one who is one minute believing and the next minute disbelieving, should not expect Anything from the Lord. And I don't know about you, but, I, but this day and all the days of my life and throughout my generations, I'm expecting everything from the Lord. Amen. He is our source. He is our supply. He is our provider and our provision. He is our all in all. God speaks and man lives. God speaks again and man lays down and dies. God has the ability to lift man up and God has the ability to bring man down. Because he is God. And beside him there is none other. 
So as we approach our sub-theme and thesis today, we want to have that as a backdrop to understand, praise God, the mindset that God requires when we're talking about faith. Because anything less than that is really not faith. It's not faith at all. One must be fully convinced uh, and have faith in God, in his authority, and in his word. Because the Christian lives based on the promises of God. That's who Jesus Christ is. He is the promise of God. He is the propitiation of God. He is our go-between. He is our bridge over trotter. He is our salvation. He is our sanctification. He is our justification. He is our glorification. We have received the promises of Almighty God. And we thank God for that. Yeah, so faith in the kingdom of heaven is to utilize one's full ability. Praise God. Let's turn to Matthew, the 25th chapter, as God begins to minister this message unto us. And the thing that I like to remind Christians of is that God is not speaking just so he can hear himself. Amen. And any time God gives a man or woman of God a word from him, it's for the benefit and blessing of the people of God because God is going to get glory from the word that goes forth as well as from the lives of the people who are the hearers and the doers. In Matthew 25 and uh, the 14th verse here, the gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter beginning at the fourth ver 14th verse, it reads like this. It says, for it is just like a man about to go on a journey. And by the way, let me preface this by reading verse 1 so that we'll know what he's, what, what he's referring to when he said it is just like. What, we want to know what the it is. The scripture says, then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable. And then it goes on this other thing about the ten virgins. But we're not going to be talking about the ten virgins. But we want to get the understanding that God is referring or wanting people to get an understanding of what the kingdom of heaven is like. So when we pick up in verse 14, when it says it, we're talking about the kingdom of heaven. So it says here, for it is just like a man about to go on a journey, who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. And I want to stop here and put a pin here for just a moment. Please get a clear understanding that God is wanting us to know what it means to be in and a part of his kingdom. He wants us to know the order of the kingdom. He wants us to know the functionality of the kingdom. He wants us to know the expectations and the requirements, the parameters of the kingdom so that we can not only get in the kingdom so that we'll know how to function in the kingdom. And, 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 and while I've got the pen there, I want to remind us that the only way to get in the kingdom is to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus Christ is Lord and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. didn't say that you might, possibly, could be. or It said you shall be saved. Why is that? Verse 10 tells us why. It says, for with the heart man believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, the Lord says, Confession is made unto salvation. Jesus Christ is the only way into the kingdom. Upon one's belief and confession of Jesus Christ as Lord, having been sent by the Father in order to bring salvation to his people, upon that belief and confession, salvation is gained. And righteousness is obtained because of one's belief in their heart. I want to stop long enough to let you know, God isn't looking at the outside of you. This, this church can be full of folk right now, and, and as a result of that, uh, every one of us can be looking good and great and shiny and brand new. Folk like to have on all kind of brand new stuff, but you know what? God isn't looking at how many folk is in this church. God isn't looking at what we're wearing. God looks on the inside of man. God looks on the inner parts of man. God wants to know what's in the heart. And the fact that we come here today to worship him, 
The fact that we come here today to serve him, the fact that we come here today to seek him, the fact that we're here today to be used of him, the fact that we're here today to bring him all of the glory, all of the honor, and all the praise, God is well pleased Amen. with us for being here today. And he wants us to know what, what, he, what he's looking for in his kingdom. Why are you wanting us to know this, Lord? So that we can put on display, so that we can have within our hearts and our minds and our souls and our being and within our lives and what we think and what we say and in what we do, the things that please God. And God is letting us know what pleases him. So he says to us in verse 14, for it, meaning the kingdom of heaven, is just like a man about to go on a journey, who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. Let's stop right there. Lord, you gave one man five, you gave another man two, and you gave another man one. Lord, why didn't you give them all five? Why didn't you give them all two? Or why didn't you give them all one? The scripture says that God gives, and we want to learn something about God here. And we want to learn something about his kingdom. God says that he gives to people according to their ability. In other words, if God had given the man uh, that he gave two, if he had given him five, that would have been more than what he could handle. Somebody better hear, me, hear the word of God preached today. If he had given the man one who he gave, uh, uh, gave, gave the man five who he gave one to, that would have been too much for him to handle. If he had given the man ten who he gave five, that would have been too much for him to handle. Lord, have mercy, Jesus. Put a P in here, because I don't think y'all getting what the Lord is saying here today. See, a lot of times, some people have a tendency to ask God for a lot of things and a lot of stuff. But God will not only not put on us uh, more than we can bear as it relates to suffering. God will not put any more on us than we can bear as it relates to success. God will not put any more on us than we can bear as it relates to trials and tribulation. And God will not put any more on us as it relates to triumph and victory. In other words, some folk can only handle so much success before it goes to the head and they end up falling because pride goes before destruction and a heart of spirit before fall. So God's got to be uh, uh, exact in what he gives us because if he gives us too much, we won't be able to handle what he gave us. So the scripture reverses us as it relates to kingdom rule and king functionality and operation that God does not give us huh, any more than we can handle. Now I'm going to tell you something. Knowing the word of God says that he won't put any more on us than we can bear, there have been times I've gone through some difficulties in my life and I've remembered that word and I said, well, if God has allowed me to go through this suffering, if he's allowed me to go through these trials, if he's allowed me to go through this tribulation, then he's found me worthy and he, and he, and he knows that I'm able to endure it. So I thank God for the fact that he was with me and that he wasn't going to put any more on me than, than I could bear because there was times that the weight and the load was so heavy I felt like I was going to be crushed. But then I remembered the word of God and I knew that I would make it Amen. Amen. Praise because he wouldn't allow too much to be on me. But I also remember the word of God when it comes to being faithful to God, when it comes to being entrusted with the things of God. Like I said, there, there are some pastors pastoring churches and, and they want a million people when they can't handle 10. <laughs> Lord have mercy. God will not put on a person more than they can bear. So God gives according to one's ability. You got some folks out there and they praying and they want a million dollars. <laughs> when the fact of it is, is they hadn't been able to handle $10. 
Uh, how do you know they couldn't handle $10, Bishop? Well, God said bring all the tithes and offering into his house that, that there may be meat in his house. God gave them $10 and they, they, they didn't even give 10 cents unto the house of the Lord because they felt that the $10 was too little to give from. Well, if what they had was too little to give from, then, then, then God isn't going to give them any more because it'll be too much to expect of them. So God gives us according, I'm going to say again, to our ability. And I've expanded on that enough. Let's pull the pen. The scripture says here in verse 15, and he went on his journey. After he gave a, a five, after he gave two, after he gave one, the Lord left it to them uh, according to their ability. Verse 16 says, immediately the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. Once again, God gave him according to his ability. And because this was well within his spectrum uh, and well within his, his reach in terms of what his capacity and ability was, he had no problem handling what God gave him. So he went out and got busy with the five that God gave him and the scripture reveals that he obtained five more. Look at verse 17. In the same manner, the one uh, who had received two talents gained two more. He wasted no time either. But now watch this. In verse 18 of this 25th chapter of Matthew, the scripture says, but he who received the one talent went away and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Wow. The one with five got busy getting five more. The one with two wasted no time getting two more. But the one with one went and buried what he had. Let me put a pin here. What God wants us to know is there's a lot of people who are Christians. There are a lot of people who are part of his kingdom who have been wasting a lot of time instead of getting busy doing God's will. They've been wasting time wishing that they had more. They've been wasting time complaining about the fact that they've got too little when it comes to the things that reflect success, whether that's money or position or power. But when it comes to uh, 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 trials and tribulations, they've been wasting their time complaining about it's too much on them <laughs> instead of trusting God and allowing him to have his way knowing that he won't put any more on them than they can bear. So the scripture says he went and buried his. Oh, Lord. God wants us to know there's a lot of buried talents in the church. God didn't give you that talent for you to sit around wishing that you had more. There are some folk who can sing, but because they're not as gifted as the next person, they just sit there and let the other folks sing instead of using the singing gift and ability that God has given them. There are some people who, have, who, who, God, is, who, who God is blessed to give, but because they, they don't have as much as, 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 as John or, or, or Jane to give, uh, then they figure, okay, well, I don't need to give because John and Jane is giving so much. Listen, God wants you to use every bit of the ability that he's given you, every bit of the talent that he's given you, every bit of the skill that he's given you. Amen. In church statistics, there's a general rule, and I pray to God it's not true. But the rule is, yeah. is that 20% of the people are doing 80% of the work. And 20% of the people are the ones who's funding the work. That means that the 20% is carrying the 80%. That tells me that there's a whole lot of buried talent <laughs> in the church. That tells me there's a whole lot of uh, 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 giving and, and resource financially that, that is buried instead of blessed. God wants us to use all of our talent according to our ability. Look at verse 19. It says, now after a long time, 
The master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. And the one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you, have, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And I don't want y'all to miss that. See, God is saying that because this servant, because this slave was faithful with the few things, just the five that God had given him, because he was faithful, God brought him into the blissfulness and the blessfulness of dealing with, with, with a massive amount because he was faithful with the little amount. In other words, God gave him open access to his kingdom. He said, enter into your, 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 uh, the joy of your master. Listen at this now, verse 22. The one also who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted to me two talents. See, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. I'd like to suggest to you that the joy of the master, once again, is the kingdom of God. In all of its blessedness and all of its blissfulness, God gave them open access to his treasures because they were faithful to honor him as God and to be good stewards with what the Lord had entrusted to them. And so it will be, praise God, for those of us who live here on earth. How we operate within the kingdom of heaven while here on earth will ultimately determine whether we have access, praise God, to the kingdom of heaven in glory and throughout time and eternity and all of the rewards that God will give to those who have been faithful. Verse 24 says, And the one who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid and went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. Wow. Out of fear, he made a decision to do absolutely nothing with the talent and the ability that God had given him. In this particular case, the talent, of course, represents a measure of money. A talent basically was 11 ounces. Whether it was a talent of silver or a talent of gold, a talent uh, in today's measurements represented 11 ounces. Okay. And whether it was 11 ounces of silver or 11, 11 ounces of gold, we were not told. But the bottom line was, is that God entrusted this person with some wealth. Praise God. And the only thing that God expected with what he entrusted to them was to, for them to engage and to use their ability with what God gave them. That's right. That's right. Wow. To use their ability. Wow. Put a pin here where I'm going. Somebody's just going to take a brief course on investing. <laughs> Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank the average person, and unfortunately this reflects upon Christians as well, they spend a whole lifetime waiting to get a lot of money so they can start saving. <laughs> oh, somebody fits to get helped up in here. We fits to get a lot of rich Christians in the house of God. Hey, amen, somebody. Huh? They, they spend a lot of time waiting on a lot of money so they can start saving. Let me let you in on a secret. What a person does with one dollar will be the same thing they do with a million. See, because with that one dollar, ten cents should go to honor God with the tithe. And maybe a penny or two or three or four or five should be given to honor him with the offering. 
But the tithe is holy to the Lord. That's an uncompromised standard and requirement that God has so that 10 cents should honor God with the tithe no matter what. Now watch this now. Whether they want to give a penny or a nickel or a dime in offering, that's up to them. But please understand this. Much, uh, the one who gives sparingly is the one who reaps sparingly. So I tell anybody, look, don't hold back on God because God is true and, 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 and let every man be a lie. The Lord says that it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. If Christians will start operating, somebody better hear me today, on biblical principles, <laughs> then they'll end up with biblical blessings. <laughs> if they'll start operating their lives on the word of God, held hold with, hold within scripture, within the Bible, then they'll get Bible-sized kinds of blessings where God blesses immensely and above and beyond anyone could ask a thing. But you got to start applying huh, the word of God. That begins with reading and study. Amen. And praying when you're alone. Oh, man, somebody going to make me pray at him. Lord, have mercy. See, somebody once said that character is not what you do in front of other people, <laughs> but what you do when ain't nobody looking. It, it may man somebody. If somebody wants the real look at what their character is and where their priority is and who they are as a person, look at what you look like when nobody's around. And if you don't like what you see, <laughs> then start letting God change some things around by lining up with his word. Oh, I just thought I'd throw that in for free. But we're still talking about this dollar. Ten cents uncompromisingly belongs to the Lord. The Lord said a tithe is holy to him. So when someone honors God with the ten cents, what they're really saying is, is God, I realize that the whole dollar belongs to you. Oh, man, I ain't got time for this, y'all. I, I tell you, I want to help somebody invest. I want to help. Hey, I want the whole church to be rich. Hey, amen, somebody. Huh? Watch this now. Uh, when we honor God with the tenth, with the tithe, we say, God, you are holy, and we're going to give to you that which is holy. We're going to honor you with that which is holy, so we're going to give you the tenth. And because we know that all of it's yours, we also want to come with an offering. Mm -hmm. Just to let you know that, that, that you've given us more than enough and we want to give you more than what you just require. In other words, Lord, I don't want to do just enough to get by. I don't want to squeak by, Lord. Lord, I, I want to be able to have more than enough and so I'm going to honor you with more than what you require. So give the ten. And give an offering. Let me, let me help somebody right here. Let me help somebody. See, I, I wasn't planning on doing all this, but I got to obey the Holy Spirit. There was a man called J.C. Penney. Somebody might have heard of his stores. Mm -hmm. This man, as legend has it, he lived off of the 10 cents, and he gave God the 90 cents, and because he pledged that 90 cents to God out of every dollar that he got, God blessed this man with hundreds of millions, good God Almighty. Oh, you, you ain't hearing me. <laughs> because he honored God as God. I've heard, too, of Christians who gave given the Lord 50 cents out of every dollar. I look at, I look at uh, uh, Chick-fil-A. Uh, their owner gives liberally unto the Lord. As a matter of fact, he refuses to open on Sunday because he sows that as, as a first fruit offering unto the Lord. And he says that because I gave a first fruit offering unto the Lord, I expect from the Lord the blessings of the Lord. And I dare you to pass by a Chick-fil-A and not see it packed every day because the man honored God, he and his wife honored God in their living and in their giving. I said I want to make you rich. <laughs> can, can you let me bless you today? 
with one dollar, honor the Lord with the tithe and the offering. Then take a percentage and pay yourself. Can I tell you why most folk never have enough? Can I tell you why most folk end up broke and always are either borrowing from somebody else? Listen to me. God wants you to be the family member that everybody comes to. Because he wants your family members to be able to look at you and say, well, what is it about this sister? What is it about this brother that they always have more than enough? We ruin our own testimony when we go to unsaved folk, amen, somebody, having to ask them for their wealth because we've not followed God's word and how we've handled ours. You can't get your, the, the funds that God entrusts to you and pay everybody else and expect for yourself to have some wealth. When a person saves money, they pay themselves. If, you're not, if a person's not paying themselves, then they'll never have anything. So whether that, you determine how much you want to pay yourself. You get to determine your own salary. You get to determine your own income. You get to determine your own bank account. You get to determine your own investment portfolio. Do you want to pay yourself 10 cents? Do you want to pay yourself 20 cents? Do you want to pay yourself 30 cents? You want to pay yourself 50 cents? How much do you want to get paid out of the company's budget? Good God Almighty. You know, in the NBA now, they got a new collective bargaining agreement, and they've upped it to whether. Well, the players got to get a larger piece of the pie. <laughs> they used to get them a real small piece. Now folk who can't play basketball at all get $100 million contracts. <laughs> Boy, you got a lot of them old NBAs rolling over in their graves saying, man, folk cheated me, and they did me right. <laughs> they did me bad. I'm talking about guys who really had some game. <laughs> you got guys who couldn't even get out of a wet paper bag good on a basketball court making $150 million. Because they're getting a larger piece of the pie. You determine how much of the pie you want. Now, now, now but, but guess what? With, without sacrifice, there's no success. See, the person who's in a hurry to go out and make everybody else rich is always going to find themselves poor. Watch this now. In other words, if the person's not willing to pay themselves, you could pay yourself half of it. Give all the Lord of the tithe of the offering. You may give him 10, 10 cents in tithe. Give him 5 cents in offering. And you may give yourself 50 cents. Okay, good. If you pay yourself 50 cents, then that means that out of, out of that, you, you've spent 65 cents thus far the dollar. And the 35 cents, now you can, go, you can go pay the bills with that or do a little shopping or something else. But you got to be disciplined enough huh, to manage that dollar. I've seen folks get, get these big, large uh, NFL and NBA contracts only to be bankrupt. I've seen folks w win the lottery only to shortly after to be bankrupt. What, you, what a person does with a dollar, huh? one dollar, the same thing going to do one million of them. God wants us to have wealth. And he wants us to be able to prosper, but we've got to do it according to Scripture. God said in Proverbs 6, look at the ant. <laughs> If you want to know how to gain wealth and to, alt, to build wealth, look at the ant. I want to tell you, you women out there, don't, don't, don't make things hard on your husband. Amen, somebody. I know I'm preaching in here. See, but I'm going to tell you something. When a man loves a woman, he wants her to have nice things. He wants her to be able to have what she wants. He doesn't want to be in a situation to where he can't provide for her or he can't minister to her need or if it's something that she wants. Why are you saying, uh, uh, speaking to women, Bishop Jai, I want you to make it easy on that man. Learn how to be disciplined in what you need and what you want. Amen, somebody. Amen, Amen somebody. And, and guess what? That, that means you can pay yourself more. So that, you, so that when it comes time to retire, folk ain't out there at, at 86 and 96 years old. Amen, somebody. Out there in the cold trying to figure out how they're going to make it. They could stop at 46 or 56. Amen. Huh? 
or, or a year sort of 66 and, and gone and live happily ever after because they got millions put back. But it's what you want to pay yourself. Let's pull this pen and get on with the scripture here. Matthew 25, let's, let's um, pick up again at, at, uh, at verse 22 here. He says, the one also who had received the two talents, he said, came up and, and said, Master, you entrusted to me uh, two talents. See, I've gained uh, two more talents. Of course, his master told him, good and faithful servant. He told him, in on into his joy. We focused on verse 24. It says, and the one who had also received the one talent came and said, Master, I know you to be hard, a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid. Can I stop and tell you that fear is the opposite of faith and faith is the opposite of fear? The person who lives their life in fear of not having enough, of not being enough, or, or doing enough, that person will not, will not have, be, or do enough. But the person who lived their life in faith and through Christ they can do all things and they put their trust and confidence in the Lord, they'll be able to achieve. All the blessings that God has purposed and ordained for their lives. But this servant here operated in fear. So he told his master, he says, and I went away and hid your talent in the ground. Therein is why so many people hide their talent. That's why so many people fail to use their ability. Because they're busy hiding it for, for, because they're afraid. I can't tell you how many entrepreneurs uh, could have launched businesses or could have went out on their own with their skill and with their ability that, that was given to them by the Lord. But because they were afraid that they wouldn't make it, they never launched out or they never pursued whatever it was. I remember Dr. E.K. Baby of the Great Concord Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, saying this one time. He said, the richest place in the world is not Fort Knox, it's not the diamond mines of South Africa, it's not the all fields of the Middle East. He said, but the richest place in the world is the graveyard because there lies a many unfulfilled dream and a many unfulfilled pursuit because people in the past have operated in fear. I want to encourage you today, good God Almighty, to operate and to live your life by faith and in faith because faith is what gets us into the kingdom of heaven and faith is what allows us praises be to God to be able to journey through the kingdom of heaven and to lay hold of the blissfulness and blessings that God has purposed for us in Christ Jesus that we may live life with the fullness of joy and the abundance of blessings that God has for us if I had to give you a definition I would put it this way Full ability huh, has not been reached until complete natural ability has been united with faith. Good God Almighty. Full ability huh, has not been reached until complete natural ability. Huh? Hey, amen, somebody. Till a person has done all that they're able to do naturally huh, and they unite their natural ability with their faith in God. Now they have exercised their full ability. Blessing be to God. Listen carefully. It says here, in verse 25, he says, But I was afraid and went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy slave. You knew that I reap where I did not sow. And gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank. And on my arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. Lord, have mercy, Jesus. The Lord said, was it not within your ability? Somebody going to make me preach and pray in here. Uh, was it not within your ability to, to cross the street and go to the bank? <laughs> Were you afraid you'd get ran over, even if you look both ways, <laughs> just across the street and make a deposit? God says he expects from us an increase from our lives. God said, I didn't bring you here. 
I didn't put you on this earth just so that you can look like what you look like when you got here. So that you can have achieved what you achieved upon your arrival. God said, I put you here so that you can bring me glory. Tell somebody my story. Be a witness. Allow the testimony of the Lord God Most High to go forth from the way you live your life. Verse 28 says, therefore take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. Good God Almighty. Take it away from him and give it to the one who has ten. Wow, that's a hard statement. But we've got to use what we have. United with faith in God. And as a result of that, we have used our full ability. I remember Pastor Tony Evans of Great Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship Church in Dallas, Texas. I remember him saying, telling this story. He said, well, there was this father and this son, and uh, the father told his son, he said, I want you to go over there, and I want you to pick up that big, big rock. Little boy went over, and this big boulder-like rock, he went to lift it up, and the little boy was straining, and, 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 the, and the father told him, he said, son, I want you to pick that rock up. Little boy looked up and he said, Dad, I'm, I'm trying to pick it up, but I, it's too heavy. He says, I want you to use all of your strength, son. So the little boy dug in a little deep and he tried to lift it. And, and knowing his daddy's expectations, he, he started crying because he, he was failing in what, what, what he was being asked to do of his father. But his daddy said, son, I want you to listen to me carefully. I want you to use all of your strength. I want you to use every bit of what you have to pick the rock up. So the little boy, once again, with tears rolling down his face, he, he, he went down and he tried to pick up that big heavy rock, that boulder-like rock, and he just couldn't lift it up. And so he looked up to his dad, crying, exhausted, and he said, Dad, I can't pick it up. And his dad, he looked right back at him with love in his, and he said, Son, you never asked me for help. So you never used all of your strength. And that's what it means to have faith in God. To not go according to our strength. But to go according to God's strength. Because what's impossible with man. Is, 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 what's impossible with man is possible with God. But we can only gain access to God's strength. Through faith in God. And that's what God wants us to do. To use our full ability. And to stop denying ourselves. And to stop denying God the glory and ourselves and our loved ones the blessings. Because we keep doubting based on what we can do. And way too many folk are running and hiding their talents, their skills, their abilities, the resources. And the blessings that God wants on open display. In the book of Exodus, so we can switch gears here and go a little higher. In the book of Exodus, the 14th chapter, we see another analogy of this so that we can bring it out a little further. If it be Lord's will, we got at least three others we'll reference, and, and I'll attempt it to get this word to you here today. But I'm not going to go past another 12 to 15 minutes. So bear with me as we get this word out to you today. In Exodus, the 14th chapter and the ninth verse, we see that another story here that is unveiling. And I'll give you the backdrop of it so that we could speed up a little bit. The Lord had delivered the nation of Israel from the nation of Egypt and brought them out of slavery and brought them out of bondage. And when they got to the Red Sea and word had gotten back to Pharaoh that the, Egyptian, that the Israelites, the people of God, were trapped at the sea, he said, oh, well, that's his he saw that as his opportunity now to go and to, to, to lay hold of them 
and, and bring them back into slavery and bondage because he felt that their God had forsaken them. So as a result of that, he mounted his armies and his horsemen, his chariots, and they went after Israel. Verse 13 opens up and says this, But Moses said to the people, Do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. Now somebody might look at that as some severe trash talking. Because here's the mightiest army on planet earth. Yeah, yeah. The mightiest army on planet earth. And Moses said that because they're coming after us, don't worry, you'll never see them again. <laughs> wow. That's operating in faith. Verse 14 says, the Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. That's why he could make that declaration. That's why he can decree what he decreed. Because he had faith in God, not faith in himself. He said, the Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Oh, my goodness. Can I put a pen here for just a moment to let you on some good news? Boy, if we'll just learn to be still and be quiet, let me tell you, we will see so many blessings from God. If we would learn to stop trying to fight our own battles and let God do the fighting for us, we would, see, we would be blissful in blessings. But we've got to learn how to be still and be quiet and let God fight the battles. I've seen folk want to, want to fight at home with the husband or with the wife. Be still and be quiet and let God fight the battle. I've seen folk on the job want to back talk to the supervisor, the manager who they feel is doing them wrong. Be still and be quiet and let God fight the battle. No matter what the situation is. We've got to learn how to be still and be quiet and let God fight the battle. Praises be to God. Listen at this now. Verse 15 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel, go forward. Wow. Here they are facing a Red Sea. A sea. And he's telling them to go forward. This thing wasn't, wasn't, 10, wasn't 10 or 20 or uh, 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 50 feet deep. This thing was a hundred, hundreds and, and, and maybe a few thousand feet deep. And he's telling them to go forward as if they're walking across a puddle of water. <laughs> Listen to me. He said, go forward. Verse 16 says, and as for you, lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the sons of Israel shall go through the midst of the sea on dry land. Moses, use your natural ability and unite it with faith in my ability. Oh, Lord, have mercy. And you and this people <laughs> shall go across on dry land. Because you use your ability. All he asked was Moses was two things. Lift up your staff <laughs> and stretch out your hand. If I had time to tell you what God asks for us is not a lot. God doesn't ask a lot from him. Whether he's saying be still and be quiet. Whether he's saying trust me and obey me. God is not asking a lot from us. He's only asking a little. He said man lift up the staff that I've given you. Let's look at what he was asking of him. God had given this man a staff of authority, a staff of power and authority to, to, to bring about miracles. All God was asking him to do was to use what he had given him, was to lift up what he had given him. And he told him to stretch out his hand. And lo and behold, as the, the word of God reveals... And matter of fact, he told, he, I, want to, I want to leapfrog to verse 21. It says, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord swept the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, so the waters were divided. Because he stretched out his hand. My God. I know what the old folks used to mean now when they say, Lord. 
I stretch my hand to thee for no other help I know. You know, God just wants us to lean and depend on him. He just wants us to trust him. He wants us to obey him so that he can bless us immensely. Verse 26 says this. I'm leapfrogging here. You have to go back and read it during your time so that you can get a deep understanding of it. But it says, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may come back over the Egyptians. So they had gotten safely to the other side. And he told him to stretch out the same hand. Good God Almighty. And lo and behold, as he stretched it out, that, whole, that mighty army, the strongest army on the na- face of the nation earth, or of, of, of the, on the face of the planet earth, was drowned in that sea. Now somebody said, well, Bishop Giles, you know, that's, this is good storytelling, and, and it's wonderful to hear that, but... You know, the Bible ain't really real. Surely they didn't go through on dry land, and surely they didn't drown the whole army. You know, I just saw a documentary um, not that long ago, and satellites from space, through, from satellites in space, they were able to look down to the sea bottom in the Red Sea. And what they found was very unique. They found coral, which takes on the shape of whatever it covers, because coral will cover whatever, it, whatever object or fixture that it, uh, that's there within the sea. And we found coral in the shape of the wheels of the chariots that belonged to Egypt. The same designs that history records those chariots were made of, they saw those wheel designs and those chariots there in the bottom of the Red Sea, just as the word of God said that they were. So I'm going to tell you something. People can look at the word of God and think, oh, well, it's wonderful storytelling, and it's wonderful. Now, yeah, let me tell you something. God is God, and beside him there is no other. And God's word is true, and it is blessed forever. And apart from God, truth does not exist. God didn't put this here to, to tell us a bedtime story. God put this here that we might learn who he is and how he works in the lives of his people so that we could be blessed and to know how to lay hold of the promises of God. Yeah, because faith united with with one's complete ability is to use one's full ability as it relates to almighty God. I'm going to go ahead and bless you and I'm going to get you in, tell you at least one more story. Turn with me to 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter. 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter. Yeah, I'm going to reveal to you one more testimony in Scripture here that God wants us to see. And maybe quote two or three Scriptures, and I'm going I'm to let you, I'm going to consider you well fed. I'm gonna, I'm, you're going to know that you had some fine dining in the Word of God. Amen, Amen somebody. 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter, and um, I want you to read in your time, verses 31 through 46, but I'm just going to tell you the story for the sake of time here and how God worked in the life of a young man that we know as King David. And uh, King David is not a figment of somebody's imagination, not a bedtime story. Uh, History bears him out as a great king of the nation Israel. And all that scripture records of him, history reveals. So all you got to do is Google it or any of these other fancy methods that we got. Technology is is at the tip of our fingers nowadays. So it doesn't take you long to find out for yourself. In 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter, in verse 31, it says here, um, and let me give a little backdrop first. First of all, we know about this, most people have heard the, story, biblical story of David, David and Goliath. And as a result of that, they have an idea of what I'm speaking of here. But what God wants us to know here is that David used his complete ability, matched with his faith in God in order to exercise his full ability in order to defeat this giant that we know as Goliath. David was told by his daddy to leave the sheep 
He said, I want you to leave the sheep and I want you to go take food to your brothers who's on the, who's on the battle lines getting ready to fight these Philistines. I want you to take to your, food, your, brothers, your brothers some food and provision. So David did as his daddy said. He left the sheep and he went to go take his brothers some food and provision. But then he heard this giant come out and, 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 and say to the nation of Israel, dare them to come and do battle with him. He was daring them to come and do battle with him. This incited something within David, and this was David's response. He says, he says this here. He says, um, he says in, in verse 25 of the, of the 17th chapter of 1 Samuel, it says, And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who is coming up? Surely he is coming up to defy Israel. And it will be that the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Then David spoke to the men who were standing by him saying, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? Who is this man who does not know God who would dare taunt the people who do know God. When David said this, no other man had stood up. No other man was willing to stand up and, and to be resolute within themselves to be ready to fight this job. And to be honest with you, I don't know too many folk looking to get in a fight with somebody who's almost 10 feet, <laughs> who battle tested and battle proven. And who is a massive giant with a massive sword ready to cut somebody. I don't know too many folk who's eager. They might fight if they have to. But I don't know too many folk who's eager to fight them with that kind of person. David wasn't eager either. But, but he was insulted by the fact that this man did not honor God as God. So as a result of that, David said that this was unacceptable. And the word got around. The people got back and told King Saul, there's somebody among us who said these things and who is insulted by what this giant has said. So King Saul summoned David to himself. But now just before we get to verse 31 where this took place, I want you to notice something that, that happened here. Out of all of the men who were there on the battle lines, only his family members were upset and enraged with the fact that David rejected what the giant was saying. Listen to this. In verse 28 it said here, Now Eliab, his oldest brother, and this is 1 Samuel 17, verse 28, Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger burned against David. Now the giant is coming up insulting God and his people. And his brother don't have a problem with that. But David says that what the giant is doing is unacceptable and, and his brother's anger burns against him. <laughs> Something's crazy about that. <laughs> Lord have me. I ain't got time to preach this. There's something wrong when folk get mad at the Christian for being a Christian but, it, but, it, but have no rebuke for the sinner. How dare you uh, uh, reflect the righteousness of God but, but say absolutely nothing about the sinner who completely disobeys and rebels against God. Something's wrong with this picture. So his, his, his anger burned against David and he said, why have you come down? And, and, and with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? See, he's insulting to his brother. He is insulting to his brother. He said nothing to the giant who has dishonored God and dishonored the people of God. Oh, but he got a whole lot to say to his brother who brought him food to eat and provision. <laughs> Lord, have mercy, Jesus. Like I said, as Christian on last week, being in the kingdom is, is having one must have the ability to to persevere, to go through rejection, yeah. even when it comes from 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 friendly fire up close. Lord, Lord. 
Lord have mercy, Jesus. It says here, and with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your insolence. Isn't that something? In other words, it's your arrogance and your pridefulness that has you speaking against the giant. Now, what was the giant speaking with, I might ask you? He says, and the wickedness of your heart. Now, God said that David had a heart after his own, and that's never been spoken about another human being on planet Earth. But his brother called his heart wicked. I wonder who's right, God or, or, or David's older brother. <laughs> I'm going to go with God. <laughs> Amen, somebody. He says, for you have come down in order to see the battle. And, and what's wrong with that? <laughs> Is there something wrong with, with his brother seeing the battle? But David said, what have I done now? <laughs> In other words, this is a usual kind of attitude and atmosphere and environment that he's gotten from family. Somebody going to make me preach. Sometimes just the people closest to people that causes them to doubt themselves, that causes them to turn away from God and the blessings of God. Because they reject them. They put them down for doing what's right. I don't know about you, but as a Christian, uh, if somebody hadn't called you holier than thou or, or thank you, Miss, Mr. and Miss Goody Two Shoe, or, or what, if somebody hadn't done something to insult you about doing what's right, <laughs> why, why it's all right for them to do what's wrong, then you might want to question whether your light's shining bright enough. But David said here, uh, what have I done now? Was it not just a question? <laughs> Can I at least ask a question? Is, it, is, is that all right? Then he turned away from him to another and said the same thing. And the people answered the same thing as before. Listen carefully. Verse 31 here of this 17th chapter, 1 Samuel. When the words which David spoke were heard, they told them to Saul and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail on account of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Then Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, while he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant was tending his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has killed both lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them since he has taunted the armies of the living God. Good God of mine. David simply said, I'm going to take all of my natural ability <laughs> and I'm going to unite it with my faith in God. Because this man has tormented, taunted the armies of the living God. And I'm going to do to him what I did with the bear and the lion. David said, I've never fought a giant before, but God has had me in training. It's been unconventional. It may not be in, have been in your army. It might not have been like how the next man's been trained. But I know the Lord is with me, and I know he's readied me for the battle. And he's given me the victory. Some of you in your life, God has done some things unconventional. You might have not gone to, to, to MBA school or whatever, but God may be moving in your life to start a business. You, you might not have a degree in business. You might not have an MBA in, or any of that kind of stuff. But God will take your natural ability <laughs> yes, yes. and match it with faith in him and cause you to produce a, 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 a multi-billion dollar corporation. God can do whatever he chooses. Amen. Sure enough, as scripture reveals, David took five smooth stones and a stick. The giant came to David and said, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? <laughs> That's what Goliath asked him. Am I a dog that you're going to come and fight me with a stick? <laughs> You got sticks? <laughs> That's what you got. <laughs> See, sometimes what we look like to the world might be puny. Yeah, yeah. Might look like nothing. Yeah. Oh, 
Well, how dare you think that somehow you're going to be uh, independently wealthy and, and debt-free and, and, and have this or have that? Or how, how dare you think that you can uh, raise the kind of children that can, that can lead this nation or be president or, or whatever they want to be? How dare you think that and you don't come? You, you haven't been to Harvard and Yale and, and Princeton. and uh, Listen to me. <laughs> Use your natural ability, every bit of it. And join it with your faith in God. And nothing shall be impossible with you. Because you have utilized your full ability. Because you have invoked the presence and the power of almighty God. May God get the glory. And may he get all of the honor and the praise. In the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen in the house of God. Your support of the Kingdom Living Broadcast helps us spread the Word of God worldwide. Please give online at www.lbchouston.org. We hope you've enjoyed the Kingdom Living Broadcast with Apostle Ken and Pastor Sheila Giles on the Gospel America Television Network.